the web. But we're just very, uh, like I said, I mean, I, that, that was one that about I had to sit down for <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> it's just praise the Lord. Um, per, prefer Windows and, huh? We have a business card back there for him. Yeah. So. <laughs> so. Yeah, we only have the one right now. But. Do what? Oh. Oh, okay. Mm hmm. Yes, it is. They're they're trying to eat. I've never heard of this before. Mm-hmm. Makes every look at the bookstores and the you know you get the old books and all the businesses that. Oh yeah, they're they're down on Hicks and Pike. Yeah, they're down on Hicks and Pike. But do what? You want. I'm sure he did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but they're, they're just, um, they're doing it the right way, being very low-key about it, and so. Um, right. Oh, sure. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd, we're definitely, so. Yep. I'm, I'm just, just letting you know. But, yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I, I'd refer them. They, they're very good with communicating, and the guys who worked here, they, just, I mean, you could, I, I had no problem. We were here the whole time they were working. So, I had no problems. So, just praising the Lord for it. Any other blessings this week? Phoebe? School, school went by easily. And you're still doing well, aren't you? Yep. You've only got a few more weeks left. Yeah. The other three wish they only had a few more weeks left. But they get next week off. So, Okay. Well, look at Luke 19, if you would please. Luke 19, this is just where I've been reading this week. I was reading here today, Luke 19, verse number, verse number 11. But yeah, God does those things from time to time and just to say, hey, I haven't forgotten about you. He shows us he takes care of us. He provides, you know. He does. Verse number 11 says, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, Therefore, certain noblemen went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And this nobleman we know is Jesus. He went away after his death, burial, and resurrection and enacted the church age. And we're in that receive for himself a kingdom time, if you will. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. The servants are a picture of us, those who are saved and Christ divvies, if you will, to us an equal amount. He does not give some more and some less of the Spirit, but we all have 
the Spirit. Christ, if you will, invests in us. He says, I saved you. I saved you for a purpose. We know he does, he does nothing by chance or happenstance. So as he invests in these servants, it says, hey, here's, here's what I have to give you. Now you go and you take care of what I've given you. Occupy till I come. Now, as sort of a side, it says, but his citizens hated him, picture of the world, and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him. There will come a time at the rapture, it seems, that at the very least the millennial reign, that all of the saints will be gathered to Christ, and it says, these to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. And he said, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over 10 cities. So these servants that were given these things are given an account to their master for what they did with what they were given. Remember, Christ invested in us. Christ invested with us, in us. What are we doing with what he invested? You say, well, what did he invest in me? Well, he gave all of us the spirit. He gave us the word of God. He gives us so much. So how are we investing that in others, in others, right? Or are we just afraid to? And you go to someone, you give them the gospel. You go to someone, you disciple them. You go, there's always a risk in investing. Any, anyone, any trader, stock trader, stockbroker will tell you there's always a risk in investing. And uh, 2 Timothy says invest in people that are faithful. You still have to take the risk, though. And sometimes you'll find out, oh, well, so-and-so is unfaithful, and you have to stop investing. I mean, you don't, you don't keep investing in a failing stock, do you? <laughs> and you pull out of that, and you invest in something that's doing well. You find people that are interested. I was reading about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a man who was interested in Christ. He climbed the tree so he could see Christ. He went, had Jesus into his home. Zacchaeus was a man prime for the gospel, if you will. He was interested. Because he was interested, he learned who Jesus was. He believed in him and was saved, you see. So we have the question... Because we'll all give an account for it, how do we invest what Jesus has given us? And who did we invest it in or attempt to invest it in? Because we're all to sow seed, right? And we'll, we'll give an account for this one day. I mean, you see in verse number 20, another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin, for I feared thee. And there's people that say, well, I don't, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to step out by faith because I'm just afraid. That's not an excuse with God. That's not an excuse that he's going to accept. I was afraid doesn't cut it because God has not given us the spirit of fear, Right? Laziness, no excuse. I just, uh, no, it's not an excuse. Not an excuse. I mean, if you read on down, you'll find that Christ, or the man who's the picture of Christ, gets very upset with the servant that did nothing. That did nothing. He even congratulates the servant that did something. The one that, you know, thy pound hath gained 
10 pounds, thy pound hath gained 5 pounds. They both, they both received praise because they did something. But the one that, oh, I just, I didn't feel like it, God. I, I was just too afraid. No, that's, that's a cop out. Jesus knows that. And there's no excuse. I caught all that while I was reading, reading today. We have to ask ourselves, ask ourselves, who have we invested in? Are we working to invest in others? Do we give out the tracts when we have opportunity? Give out the Bible study books? I mean, those... You can take, you can drain that thing many times over talking about the book rack. I don't care. We'll keep buying them. You buy them for Christmas gifts if you want. If you know of people that'll, that'll use it, give them out. If you say, well, there's no, there's no book that I'm interested in studying through. Let me know. I'll write one. It'll take a few months, but I'll write it. There's no better motivation than knowing that someone's going to use it on the back end. <laughs> <laughs> no greater motivation than a deadline, right? Uh, take a discipleship book. If you know someone that's interested in discipleship, you say, well, I don't know anyone. Well, pray that God would send someone across your path. And he will. And he, he does at times. And so that's all we can do. That's all we can do. It's not about the tens and the hundreds of thousands. It's about just the one at a time, praying for them, being a good testimony before them, trying to encourage them, and, and maybe they're strangers that God brings across our path, being a blessing to people. You say, well, will people take you for granted? Well, yeah, many of them do, but that's the ministry. And it's a risk to work with people. Yes, it is. But that's the work. That's what we're called to do. And so, it is worth the risk. Because for all the tens that may fall through, you have, you have a few, a few that are interested. A few that will come, and, and those are worth it. I mean, even the ones that fell through are worth it because you gave them a shot, right? You gave them a chance. They can't say, you never offered or I never offered. But the ones that come forth to fruition, I mean, how much better is that? How wonderful is that, you know? So, anyway, before I preach the whole message on that. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, if you would, and we'll look at, Part 71 of Giving Thanks Always, look at the topic of godly love again. Ephesians 5 and verse number 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, we thank you so much for your blessings upon us. Thank you for all that you have done for us this week. The unexpected things that you do to let us know that you love us, that you care. We just pray that you would help us to continue on day by day to be faithful. When you give us opportunities to speak to people for you, help us to do it. And help us to invest, whether it's sowing that seed of the gospel or teaching someone the doctrine of Christ or whatever it is. Help us to do it, to not be afraid. If we are afraid, help us to do it anyway. Help us to do it by faith, not letting fear control us. Father, we live in a day, and really the world has probably always been this way, but we especially live in a day of fear. People are afraid of COVID. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. So much fear. We pray you'd help us to not be given over to it. Thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
So number one, are you thankful that you're God's child? Are you thankful that you're God's child? That God sent his son, he saved you. It is a wonderful thing to be God's child. He does take care of us. He knows exactly what we need. It may seem like a small thing, but the small things are the small things. We may see some big things, but whatever it is, blessings are blessings. We have to learn to see them for what they are. Are you thankful for God's word? Have you been in it this week? What have you gleaned from it? What has God been pinpointing in your life? And are you working to obey that? If we don't, we're not becoming more like Christ. We'll just keep hearing the same thing over and over and over and over again. But if we are, then we're growing in the faith. And God will keep speaking through his word. Are you thankful for God's spirit? That helps us to bear the fruit thereof. And verse number 22 of Galatians 5 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And we're looking first at love. The Bible sometimes calls godly love charity. We considered on Sunday the three types of love that are found in the Greek language. In the scriptures, you have philos, which is friendly love. Remember that? Friendly love. Yes, we are friends, right? We consider that. Then storge, which is familial love or love of family. Consider that and how it's spoken only in the opposite in the scripture as a condemnation of sorts that this world does not love its family. Then agape, which is godly love, and that's what we're considering. That love is perfect. It's in accordance with God's word. It's a choosing and unconditional love. Never forget that. I hope you don't. It's a choosing and unconditional love. It means it never stops. It never stops. You choose to love someone with godly love. That means you never stop loving them. Now, at times you may have to, um, with people, disassociate from them, and it may break your heart to have to do so. But it doesn't mean you stop loving them, right? It's a choosing and unconditional love. Now, one cannot... Uh, uh, consider godly love without consulting 1 Corinthians 13, honestly. And that's where we're going to be for the next several weeks. And it's rather interesting that it's around this time of the year that we're looking at what the Bible says about godly love as we enter into the Christmas season and consider the greatest love that exists, which was God sending his son to die for us. And so 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible says in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, Paul says, I am nothing. And though I bestow stow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. It profiteth me nothing. So the first under this topic of charity or godly love is charity above all. Charity above all. We actually haven't gotten into the definition of what Godly love is the first part of 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 through 3, and then even the latter part kind of encapsulates the definition with the statements of charity is a must-have for the believer. Charity is a must-have. Godly love is a must-have. We need to be known as a people that choose to love 
and keep loving. We watched Shark Tank last night and saw that there is a company being started up, I don't know if it still exists, but started up by two ladies uh, to help couples in our day get prenuptial agreements before they get married and to have cost-effective ones. A prenuptial agreement is an agreement that two individuals make going into the marriage about certain things. I don't have an exact definition for you, but it can even affect should they get a divorce. It affects bank accounts and things like that. Should believers get a prenuptial agreement? No. <laughs> no. You say, well, pastor, why in this day full of divorce? If you have to go into a lawyer's office and you're thinking about the possibility that you're going to divorce your per spouse in the future, which is what prenuptial agreement makes you consider. If there is a possibility of divorce in the future, then you shouldn't marry that person to begin with. <laughs> Because when you say, I do, that is saying, I do for life. Right? Godly love, unconditional love. And by the way, kids, and kids, yeah. Heather, you're a kid too, in this case. You come to me for premarital counseling. We're going to talk about all manner of things. And if you didn't know who you were marrying, you will by that point. <laughs> but people just enter into marriage like it's a casual thing today, don't they? And they think divorce is nothing when divorce is a destroyer of families. I mean, we've talked about it before. Divorce just destroys children destroys children. People joke about it, and, and they do make jokes. Oh, I get two Christmases, and on and on and on. It's a destroyer of families. But this world, all they think about is money, not love. If they think about anything related to love, it's usually lust. Oh, you look pretty good, so I'll marry you. Or your bank account looks pretty good, so I'll marry you. Yeah. Godly love is a must-have for every believer. That's why it's first on the list of fruits of the Spirit. It's the most important. Yes, it makes, seriously, in the Greek, the first and the last on a list are the most important things. God even devoted a whole chapter so that we can make no mistake about what godly love is, where he says it's a must have. It's a must have. It's a must have. And so let's look at a few things here. In the beginning of this chapter, we see Paul make a few introductory statements. And maybe they're a little confusing, but let me explain what it's saying. Each one of these statements begins with the word though. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Though I have the gift of prophecy. Though I have all faith. Though I bestow all my goods. Right? Though I give my body to be burned. You, you read that and it makes you think, well, Paul did all this? Paul had this understanding? Paul, was, he's a really gifted man. That's not what it's saying at all. The word though needs to be taken as not an actuality, but a possibility. See the difference? It's not that Paul was these things. It's Paul saying, if these things came to pass. The word though is to be taken as grant, admit, or if. I just have the word if written in my Bible. But it, it could be either one of those three and be accurate. Grant, grant that God would allow me to speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Grant that God would allow me to have the gift of prophecy. Something along that line. I just have if 
because it, it carries the same thing. If I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, if I have the gift of prophecy, if, because it's possibility, not actual. Paul didn't really sell all his goods. <laughs> He's talking about possibility, not actuality. Paul didn't give his body to be burned. He's talking about possibility, not actuality. It's something that could happen, but has not. If you look up Webster's 1828 dictionary, you find that definition in so many words. Grant, admit, or if. He does not speak with all tongues. He does not understand all mysteries. He does not have all knowledge. He does not have all faith. He did not give all of his goods or give his body to be burnt. It's all hypothetical. The point that he's trying to make is you could have these things, but if you don't have them with love, it's no good. <laughs> if you don't have them with godly love as the motivator, it's no good. Oh, there's, there's plenty of people that do these things in the world, but they do them for selfish reasons. They do them for self-profit, right? So we, we as children of God, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we as people that say we are saved, we are Christians, disciples of Christ, right? We are to do the things that we do out of love, godly love for Christ. Doing it because it pleases him, not because it pleases us. Doing it because it helps us to draw closer to Christ, not because it puts a little more coin in our pocket or puts our face on a billboard. You see the difference. Paul could have been the mega church preacher of his day. But he wasn't. He was obscure. Hated even by certain groups. He could have compromised and schmoozed with all manner of people and just smoothed it all over. Oh, you don't want me preaching this God. You want me to put the law in there and say you have to be uh, circumcised and keep the Sabbath. Oh, I can do that. He could have schmoozed it all over, but he didn't because he loved God and his word more than anything. So look at three things. We're not going to get through all of it tonight. We'll probably only get through the one. But number one, spiritual gifts without the proper motive, which is godly love, Spiritual gifts without the proper motive are useless. Useless. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, tongues being languages, and have not charity. This is not to say that Paul spoke with the tongues of angels. This is a hypothetical statement. That's why it's important to interpret the Bible properly. Because there's people that would say, oh, you can speak with the tongues of angels. No, it's not saying here that he did. It's saying if, it's a hypothetical, it's a theory, it's a, it's a what if scenario. <laughs> and he's saying, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or godly love, I'm become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though or if I have a gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries have all knowledge. And it goes on from there. So spiritual gifts without the proper motive are useless. We, we haven't looked at spiritual gifts for a long, long time. So we're going to look at it a little bit now. And it's the perfect time because 1 Corinthians 12 covers spiritual gifts. It leads right into 1 Corinthians 13. The two chapters really can't be separated, though they are. That's why we say the chapter and verse divisions are not inspired, because they're not. There's some divisions that are more obvious than others. These two chapters, they fit back to back. The concepts flow, right? So you have to consider the con context, if you will. 
So first, if you look back in 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 1, we find that the Spirit of God gives spiritual gifts. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. Now we're looking at spiritual gifts. And our spiritual gifts must, must have godly love with them. It doesn't matter what we do. What we do. If we have godly love about us, we'll do it for the right reasons. We'll do it with the right attitude. And so we understand it's the Spirit of God that gives us our spiritual gifts. Every believer has at least one spiritual gift. You're saved here tonight. You've got a spiritual gift. You say, I don't know what it is. Well, we have a whole discipleship lesson on it. But most of you probably know what yours are. But everyone has at least one. Many people have several I, I come to find that you generally have the spiritual gifts that you need to have. And, uh, with a spiritual gift, you also have a place in, in the ministry of the local church. We see these things, verse number one. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, Paul says, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. He's saying you're Gentiles. You worshiped idols. You just did whatever you wanted to do. Whatever felt good. You know, it wasn't anything but that of the flesh. Wherefore, Paul says, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So it's the Spirit of God. He allows us to praise, glorify, and follow Christ. We understand that. He, he helps us. He's our comforter, our assistant. He helps us to do those things. And you can tell, James, uh, 1 John chapter 4 says a similar thing about what verse 3 is talking about. Uh, how no one's, that's filled with the Spirit, no one speaking by the Spirit of God will call Jesus accursed and what have you. This is not the only way to discern who is and who is not saved, but it is one way. And we see, secondly, um, the Spirit of God, he doles out various gifts and ministries according to God's will or God's word. The two are inseparable, we understand. Verse number four says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's different spiritual gifts. There's many of them. But there are no more than is outlined in the Bible diversities of gifts. I, I have to say that because there's people that will run around, oh, I have the spiritual gift of music. There is no spiritual gift of music. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Oh, I have the spiritual gift of warfare. Okay, <laughs> that doesn't exist in the Bible. <laughs> oh, I had a young man and I was way, way too immature to even address it at the time. I was in public school and a young man who went to some, I don't, I don't know and don't want to know what church he went to. He came in one day and he said, I found out that I'm a, I'm a warrior for Christ. I'm a watchman. Like, okay, what's that mean? <laughs> and he went on, it was this way off the wall type of thing. Like he's gone battling demons and stuff like that. It's like, Okay, you have a good day. That's about all I could do at that point in my spiritual walk. <laughs> yeah. But there's people, they make these things up. There's people take things out of context and what have you. We'll get to that. There's di gift, diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are diversities of administrations. That word means ministries, but the same Lord. Differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Different local churches can have different ministries, right? How do the ministries come about? As the people are burdened to have them. It's not just about the pastor. <laughs> it's as the people are burdened to have them. And if there's no burden, 
then the ministry doesn't happen. Like for instance, my wife wants to get a ladies Bible study going at some point in the near future, but if no one's interested in it, she's not gonna do it. Right, dear? Yeah. It's like we wanna do something like a Christmas banquet, maybe a winter banquet. You know, I don't know, for us to do a snowman banquet, something, just something where we have a good time together after a, a Sunday service and you can invite friends and family to or what have you. But if no one's interested in it, then we're not going to have it. That's, that's just how it is. Now, I, I grew up in the old school think, well, you have it and you advertise for it. It doesn't matter if it's just your family. No, it's, it's the whole church involved. If no one's interested in it, we're just not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Now, there's certain things like visitation. Eventually, maybe in the next few months, we'll get visitation started back up. And even if it's just me and my family, we, we would do that. But, you know, if, if it, it, it can't just always be us. It's got to be a burden of the church. Saying, hey, I, I so-and-so is, is, uh, at one point, it was so-and-so is in jail. Would you go visit them? Hey, so-and-so is in the nursing home. Could we have a service there? And people helping with that. There's just so many different things. So-and-so needs a meal. They can't get out. They don't have anyone to help them. Could we help them? There's so many things that could be done. There's, it's not limited to whatever my imagination can come up with. There's differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There's diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. So he gives out various gifts and ministries according to God's will and God's word. I, I found over the years, you may agree, that just God brings these things across our way and gives us a burden for them. Verse number seven, we find that he, the Spirit of God, is manifested so that we will profit spiritually. But the manifestation or the revealing of the Spirit is given to every man, talking about everyone in the church, so everyone has a spiritual gift, to profit with all. And that's not talking about profiting for money or power or things of the flesh. It's talking about you have your spiritual gifts so that you can invest in someone, so that you can help someone in some way. And it might be something very small, or it might be something to you that's very great, whatever your perception is of it. If it's a gift, if it's something that Christ has invested in you and me, it falls to us to find out what it is and to utilize it the best that we can for God's glory through the local church so that we can become more like Christ and so that we can glorify God in it, right? Yeah, we have this food here. Why would we give it to people? Just to be nice people? No, so we could say to you and say to folks, here, we want to be a blessing to you and give God the glory for it, right? And that's just one small way. Verse number eight, we find that he tells us exactly what these gifts are. We're not left to wonder or make them up by ourselves. God knows we have very good imaginations. No, he tells us exactly what these gifts are. And we have them in no less than three places, really. Two main lists in scripture, but three places and we see here in verse number eight through 11 the list of spiritual gifts that we are given so we're going to jump around a little bit and go out of order because I, that's just how this list is that i have in my notes but consider a few things if you would first corinthians 12 28 first the first gift is that of apostleship God has set some in the church first apostles. Apostle is, and you see this again in Ephesians 4.11. It's a gift of God. I will say 
that apostles do not exist. Every once in a while, you'll run across, oh, I'm apostle so-and-so. No, you're not. <laughs> there are no apostles today. And here's the reason why. The word apostle is the word apostolos, which means sent one. I mean, we're all, in this case, apostles of a sort because we're all sent with the gospel. But the office of apostle is a very specific one, specific office. It was given by Jesus Christ to the 12, including Paul, right, as Judas was not saved. But it's not in use today. This was a gift given for the founding of the church, 2 Corinthians 12, 12 states, and was accredited by special signs. I don't know about you, but I'm not going around performing signs and wonders, and neither is apostle or apostolist so-and-so. <laughs> um, it was a special thing, these apostles. You, you've heard me say before, they would go around, and they could stop at any given church and just tell them what to do. And it was expected that the local church would listen because they had that sort of authority. These were those that had been with Christ. They had seen him with their very eyes. They had been specifically called by him to the work of an apostle, and there are none like that today. You say, well, what about Paul? Paul saw Jesus on the Damascus Road. Paul was called by Christ specifically to be an apostle. So we don't have apostles today. We just, just have normal believers. But it, it was one of the spiritual gifts, but relegated to just a few. You have prophecy, which shows up in all of these lists. Prophecy, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12.10 says to another prophecy, Ephesians 4.11. Prophecy can be taken two ways, and one portion of it is phased out. There's some of these spiritual gifts that are called sign gifts. The sign gifts were given for one reason, and that was to uh, make sure that people knew that the gospel was true. It was to legitimize the gospel, sign gifts. So we have no need for that today. As we finish up with 1 Corinthians 13, we'll see where it talks about the Bible and how the Bible replaces the sign gifts. We have everything we need in the Bible. Everything we need. I made the comment the other day online. We have no need for signs. I don't know about you. When I was a teenager and even into college a little bit, I was really big into that. Into signs. and God, give me a sign. God, give me peace. And that's why I grew up around. How many times have you heard people, oh, I'm praying for peace about that. What are you praying for? A shiver down your spine? Are you praying to, to get into some zen-like state about something? We, we don't pray for peace unless you're in the midst of something and you're praying for the comfort of God on your life. But we don't need to, we, we shouldn't pray for peace about a decision that we need to make. Now, everything that we need is in God's word. Everything that we need. Uh, folks that say, oh, I'm praying for peace about this. What they're saying is, I don't want to do what God wants me to do. I know I've been there. Uh, may, I, I mean, maybe I'm the only, you know, rebellious <laughs> person out there, but I, I somehow doubt it. We need no need, we have no need for signs. No need for signs. No need for what they call portents. We just need to get in God's word, know what it says, and believe it. This is all the signs and wonders we need. It's a miracle enough that God saved us. He teaches us from his word. He does various other things for us that we can even, just like I mentioned, during praise time, right? We're online now. I'm not going to talk about it. But yeah, God does those things. For his glory. Things we're not even looking for or hoping for. I'll say again, he put a little, little cat in back along the fence. And people say, oh, well, that was just a chance. You just found that cat. No, God put him there. 
That's how much I believe that God has his finger on everything. And we all need to believe that. There are no coincidences. Let's say that word again. Coincidences with God. They don't exist. Every, I, I can't tell you over the past week, I've read the, the sayings by Spurgeon, Tozier, and Ryle, and what have you. I've said that they believe every tiny point, even the, the smallest things, even the trials and troubles, are for our good, for our benefit from a God that loves us. And we can't help but believe otherwise, because it's true. So, coming off the rabbit trail for prophecy, we consider prophecy in a general sense for preaching, okay? Prophecy is in two parts. One is forth, F-O-R-T-H, forth telling the word of God. And another part is foretelling the future, right? You think of a prophet, they would say, well, God's going to do this, and then God would do it. If it was a false prophet, God wouldn't do it. Fourth, telling the scriptures is what we're trying to do tonight and what we try to do every service. What my wife does at Sunday school, we take the Bible and explain what it's talking about. Unto application, that's what preaching is. Taking the Bible and applying it to our lives for God's glory. And so... That is definitely a spiritual gift. That is something that exists today. Every uh, pastor must have this gift if they're to be a preacher. But it's not exclusive to pastors because we're all to be preachers of the gospel. It's not exclusive to men because ladies can teach ladies from the word of God. Right? And so... It is a very alive and well spiritual gift today. In a general sense, it talks about preaching. In a technical sense, it talks about proclaiming new revelation, but we have no new revelation today. Once revelation, the book, was finished, the revelation from heaven ceased. We live in a day of no open vision. I know people say, well, that's, that's very frustrating, and I hate to believe that God wouldn't speak to us in that way, and blah, blah, blah. Well, we, we seem to forget that there was, I think if my memory serves me correctly, it was either three or 700 years of silence in between the time of Malachi and the book of Matthew, if you will. It's not the first time God's been silent. God simply, he gave us everything that we need in the 66 books of the Bible. I mean, what more do we want? Well, I want to know about aliens. Well, God doesn't want us to know about aliens. <laughs> Seriously, people say that sort of thing. I want to know more about angels and demons. God doesn't want us to know more about angels and demons because he knows how idolatrous we are. <laughs> People already get so far into that stuff and shouldn't. Seriously, that's how people are. I see them talk about these things all the time. I want to get into that. I, God should have told us. No, God gave us everything we need in his word. No more open vision. No new revelation. Someone shows up on TV or shows up on your doorstep and says, hey, God gave me a good word, and it's not a good word from here, then say, okay, you have a good day. If it's on TV, just shut it off. There have been people all since Jesus left this earth trying to say, I've got something new. Ever since Revelation's been closed, I've got something new. People just wanting attention, wanting to make money. I've got something new. God gave me this book. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. We consider in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, number three, miracles. Miracles. Now, these sign gifts, this is not to say that God can't do these things, because certainly he can. Certainly he does. I count what happened today to be a miracle. You praise God for it. Miracles in the act of the divine, right? But he doesn't do these things on demand. 
you know, I've heard preachers, you probably heard them too, telling people, go around, you tell God what to do. You say in Jesus' name like it's some magic spell. Like just because you say in Jesus' name, God's going to divert the hurricane. God's going to give you a million dollars. God's going to get rid of COVID. God's going to do get the next Republican or Democrat president in or out or whatever. People literally act this way. God does still do miracles. We're just not satisfied in our flesh. We're not satisfied with what he chooses to do. The greatest miracle he's ever done is saving a soul from hell. Sending his spirit to resurrect a dead spirit, giving us a new desire, a new life in Christ. I mean, imagine where you would be. And kids, I know you haven't lived that long, but still imagine, you, you look at these kids on TV, you look at these kids in the public school, and, and you say, praise God I don't have to be in that mess. It's not that you stand as the Pharisee in front of the publican saying, I praise God, I'm not as this man. No, no, no. You just say, thank you, Lord, for saving me out of that, saving me from it, keeping me from the mistakes I would have made. I mean, folks, I kid you not, I know myself. My wife, she knows herself. I, I can only imagine the mess that we'd have gotten into over the years. It's by God's grace, as Paul said. Paul knew himself, and he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's a great miracle. God saved us. God saved us. And I know we get all, all calloused about it because we wake up day in, day out, 365 days a year. And if you don't, then it's my temptation you get calloused about it. You say, hey, it's another day, you know. And you have to encourage yourself in the Lord and say, hey, God hasn't forgotten us. God loves us. God has saved us and we are his. He is ours. It's a wonderful thing. There's no greater miracle than that. The miracle that God speaks to us from his word. The miracle that we continually grow in Christ. Yeah, I, I know it's not fire and brimstone down from heaven, or turning water into wine, all those, you know, we don't need. Now, when God does perform a miracle along those lines, then we say, hey, <laughs> that's my God. But we have to be thankful for what we have and see it for what it is. Miracles, then we have healings, healings, Verse number nine talks about the gift of healing. Verse 28, gift of healing. Verse 30, same chapter, gift of healing. Again, sign gift. Does God heal people today? Yes, he does. Just not on demand. Just not on demand. He does it according to his will. So can we pray and ask God, God, would you please heal this person? Would you help them to get better? Yeah, absolutely. But it's up to his will whether or not it'll be done. It's not for us to smack Jimmy on the head and say, Jimmy, you get better because I say so and God's got to do what I say. No, that's, that's not how it works, folks. That's not how it works. Those healings, Jesus healed people not because, well, he, he loved them, certainly, but he did not have a healing ministry. He didn't heal everyone he came across. He healed people who believed. Read the Bible. People like to believe. Oh, Jesus, he's just the, yeah, the, I'll take the, the phrase great physician out of context. He's the great physician. He just went about healing everybody. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. There were people in Rome, Italy that Jesus didn't heal. Right? There were people in Paul's hometown of Tarsus, Jesus didn't heal. Jesus didn't have a healing ministry, though Jesus did heal people. 
He healed them according to his will, which was the Father's will. You say, well, why did Jesus then heal just those? Because they were proofs of his gospel. Proofs that what he was preaching was true. And the Mosaic law demanded that he do that to prove that he was a true prophet. The Jews, 1 Corinthians 1 says, look for a sign. The Pharisees came to Jesus repeatedly and said, give us a sign, even though he gave them who knows how many. Yeah. We don't have healing ministries today because the healing ministries have never been for that purpose. It's just been for sign gifts to show the validity of the gospel. But does God heal and should we pray? Sure. Absolutely. God. I've seen God heal people. I've seen him. Had a man in the jail. We, pray, we weren't trying to see this man get healed or anything. But a man in the jail had terrible nerve pain. I think it was in his leg. This has been years ago. And we would pray after discipleship. Pray, Lord, please help Dave with his, with his leg, with his nerve pain. Because there was nothing that anyone could do for it. Especially not in the jail. All they could do was give painkillers, and it was, it was terrible nerve pain. And he came back. We prayed one We uh, had discipleship finished up, prayed. And he came back, and he said, as soon as we prayed, he said, my pain went away. He said, it hasn't come back. I said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> but God did that because he wanted to. And so we get tongues. We're going to have to finish up because we're just spending more time on this than I thought we would. Verse number 10 of 1 Corinthians 12, tongues and the interpretation of it. Diverse kinds of tongues and another, the interpretation of tongues. Two different, two different spiritual gifts, one to speak, the other to interpret. And there's people, of course, today who say, well, I speak in tongues, and tongues and the interpretation were a sign gift. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 lays out the rules for it. If you want to read that on your own time. Paul never really emphasizes tongues. None of the other apostles did, but it's a big deal today, isn't it? Especially charismatics, Pentecostals. It gets people attention. It's a way to stand up and, and be seen. Because if people kept to the rules given in 1 Corinthians 14, then it would just die. It would fizzle out altogether. People don't care what the Bible says. They just want to do what feels good. You say, what were tongues back in this day where it's talking about the sign gift of tongues? Tongues just means languages. Literally, word glossa in the Greek language means languages. It's a known language. You see in Acts chapter 1, they began speaking in tongues, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down. And it's the same word. It's known languages. It was during the time of Pentecost. There were a great many Jews from different uh, provinces, Roman provinces, come in. People that spoke a lot of different languages. And so the Holy Spirit came down, and people like to say, well, they were out of control, and they're, you know, like the Pentecostal services today. No, it was a very controlled thing, and these people were all speaking in different languages the same thing which is the gospel. You read it in Acts chapter 2 where it says, we hear the marvelous works of God. So it wasn't the tongues of angels, you know, a heavenly language. It was known languages, people standing up and preaching the gospel so that people could hear it in their language. It's a sign gift. 
Now, it did come apparently to where people would um, feel like they should speak in tongues, which is why 1 Corinthians 14 comes about. And Paul says, no, 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 you don't have someone speaking in tongues. And, and tongues could be, I mean, for us, it could be anything like Spanish, French, Arabic, Russian, Chinese, whatever, a known language. Someone come in here, start speaking Mandarin. I don't know what they're saying because I don't know that language. Maybe you do. But say someone comes in here and, and uh, someone decides, well, the Holy Spirit's come upon me. I need to speak, stand up, start speaking in Mandarin. Paul says, no, 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 no. You don't do that without someone who can interpret. Because otherwise it's just confusion. It's chaos. And in the same passage, you have that God is, does all things decently and in order. So someone speaks in tongues and someone should be able to interpret. If there's no one to interpret, the Bible literally says that person needs to be quiet because it's just, it's just your flesh or, or maybe it's something you need to keep to yourself. There's plenty of things the Bible says, hey, you have a thought, you have a dream, you have this, that, and you think it to be something, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> or ask, you know, ladies, it says, ladies, ask your husband about it. You know, things like that. Or people can ask me or, or things like that. But th there's plenty of people that refuse to do that. No, I got to stand up and I got to share it before the whole church. No, 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 no. No, no, no. So tongues interpretation of it. Just, it was a sign gift. No one has spoken in legitimate tongues since scripture was completed. What, you say, well, what's been done today? What's being done today is just of the flesh or at worst. And I hate to say this. I can only imagine that some of it is, though. Some of it could be demon possession, demonic. Say, well, how do you tell which is what? I'd, I'd have to be there for it. <laughs> so you, you can't assume. But you can only imagine that some of it is. Most of it's probably just people in the flesh. And... Does God help people to understand languages today? Oh, yes, absolutely. Does he give people a special understanding of languages? Yes, absolutely, because there's missionaries that need help understanding languages. There's Bible translators. I, I admire many of these Bible translators. These guys have to learn a language and then translate from the Greek into that language. That's... Not my cup of tea, it may, maybe it's yours, but there's some people that just love language. Isn't, isn't Gabrielle one of those people? She just loves Spanish or something. Yeah, people just, there's some people, they just love sign language. Sign language is a foreign language. You know? Some people love French and the various languages. God gives people a love for that. You say, well, why? There's likely going to be something down the road where that will come into use. We only got to look at four of the spiritual gifts tonight, but hopefully it'll be an encouragement or it has been encouragement in some way. As we start on this, we'll complete it or at least continue it on Sunday. But I encourage you to read through 1 Corinthians 13 and um, Contemplate what it's saying. Think about it. And if you don't know what spiritual gift you have, look through the lists in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. See what God maybe speaks to you about. Talk to me or my wife about it. If you have a burden about something you'd like to see done in the church at any time, I mean, we're available 24-7. Feel free to talk to us and we'll see what, what can be done. But um, we'll pick these things up on Sunday. Lord, thank you for this time. Pray it was a help to someone. And we'll thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Any prayer requests tonight? Sarah? The decorating goes well? Absolutely.
pray no Christmas trees fall on anyone this time. Right? Yep, this time. Unspoken. Pat, you had an unspoken last week too. Keep praying, okay. okay. Anyone else? Sarah again. Good Have a good break. Yeah. Be yeah. That's a, that is a good things to pray for. I'll be sure to put our kids to work the whole now. Try to keep a break as a break. Anyone else? Okay. Pray for Matthew as he's at Pensacola. Phoebe, she's... Oh, your class gets over like the 11th of December, I think. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So pray for her with that. She has one more unit test to do. Then the high schoolers, as they finish up school tomorrow before their break. Dad with the estate, mom, she's healing. Brother Fred Carroll with his healing. And he's just, he's not doing very well, but just please keep praying for them. Pray for Teresa and Pat with their unspoken requests. Decorating tomorrow. Everybody be safe. Have a good time. Have a good break. Or that the kids would have a good break. Sarah might have withdrawal. She won't get to see the cat for a week. But have a restful break. Anyone else? All right. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time, and we thank you again. We can be here this evening. Thank you for the blessings that you brought our way. We just pray that you'd help us to continue on and to be good testimonies and to be faithful for you. We pray you'd work in hearts of this community, that people would be interested in the gospel, that they would be followers of Christ. And we know we've gotten out of these last two years, we've gotten out of sync or out of habit or what have you, as just visitation especially has been pretty much destroyed with COVID. But during this time, we've seen how you bring people across our paths that we can help and encourage. And while we may never see the results of our influence or the sowing of seed. Help us not to be focused on that, but to be concerned with being faithful. We just pray you'd help those family members that we have, those neighbors that we interact with, help us to be pleasant and kind, good testimonies. And when people go to hell, May they have to crawl over us to get there. Not that we can save anyone or grab them by the ankles and plead or make them be saved, but we can do our part and people can know about you. We just pray that you'd be with our family members, especially coming up the holidays. It's a joyous time for some and a hectic time for others. 
We just pray that you be with our family members that don't know you, that you would draw them to you, and that as they see us make Christmas about Christ, that they would be impacted. And as they see us make Thanksgiving about what you've done in our lives and not about Black Friday and not about bowl games or turkey, help us just draw those folks to you and we'll give you the glory. Father, we pray that you'd be with Matthew as he's in college, that you'd help him and give him good perspective, help him to draw close to you and help him with the things he has to do, we pray. Be with Phoebe as she's working on this college class and we thank you for helping her with it. Pray you be with the kids as they have school tomorrow and they're plodding along week by week, and we're thankful at their progress. We just pray you'd help them, help them to have a restful break, and to do well and get the rest that they need. Pray that you'd be with decorating tomorrow, that all would go well, and that we would have a good time of fellowship together, and that everything would go up without incident. Father, we thank you for that. We pray that you would help mom with her healing as she has this doctor appointment coming up. May it go well, we ask. We pray you be with dad, with the estate. You continue to help him, give him wisdom. And Brother Carol with his kidney problems, just pray that you'd help him. Give him your grace through this time. Lord, we pray you be with Pat, with her unspoken request that you would meet that need perfectly as only you can. You get the glory for it. And Teresa, with her unspoken request that you would meet that need perfectly and that you get the glory for it. Your hand would be seen in all these things. I pray the things that we've talked about tonight, that it was an encouragement and a help. We see you work. You do things that we don't anticipate. And we just praise you. Help us to be faithful. Help us not to get discouraged. But keep going. We'll be glad we did. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 43, if you would, please. Great is thy faithfulness. We'll stand together and be finished for the night. 43, let's stand together. Great is thy faithfulness, and we'll be dismissed. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Well, God bless you for being here tonight. We trust you'll have a good week. If you need anything, please let us know. But please take these things, write down the blessings, let it encourage you. And we'll see you, Lord willing, on Sunday at 10, if not 10, then 11. God bless you.